This show is produced by the Hartman Media Company. For more information and links to all our great podcasts, visit HartmanMedia.com. Welcome to the American Monetary Association's podcast, where we explore how monetary policy impacts the real lives of real people and the action steps necessary to preserve wealth and enhance one's lifestyle. It's my pleasure to welcome Harry Dent back to the show. He's been on many times with us. And as you may know, I discovered his work back in 1995. I've been a fan ever since. He really looks at the demographic side of economics, which I think is a, a very powerful way to look at big macro trends. And he's here today to talk about what is going on. And there is a lot going on with bubbles popping everywhere we look. Harry, welcome back. Good to be back, Jason. It's good to have you always, always. So we were talking off air a little bit, and you were on just a couple of months ago, too, about how this bubble was a bubble that was going to pop anyway. Coronavirus is just sort of an excuse or maybe it's cover, the inevitable to happen. Yeah, well, you know, I'd call it the perfect trigger, Jason, because this is one thing. I mean, they can do massive money printing and fiscal stimulus and stop a recession in its track. They can stop a stock slide or crash. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they did that in, in early 2009. All this money printing and stuff does not stop the virus. Mm -hmm. It cushions the economy from the virus. Right. So the virus is perfect in that it causes a sudden shock, not a gradual one like a recession naturally building it where, OK, the economy weakens and then more businesses default and lay off and then it weakens more. No, this is we're suddenly we're in a depression mm -hmm. right now. Yeah. Probably, you know, officially 14.7% unemployment, probably really or, or to be 20% GDP is going to be down, you know, I was I think it was down 6 or 7% the first quarter is going to be down could be 20% or more wow. in the second quarter. And that's just temporary. That yeah. that level won't last, but right. this is depression. You mm -hmm. have to go back to 19 30 to 33 to find unemployment and GDP drops and things like this. So it's a big hit, but it is temporary. Mm -hmm. and, and I was, uh, Jason, like uh, it was very late. It was third week in March when the markets were, you know, just had bottomed and, you know, thought this virus was just going straight up. I said, no, if you look at an S curve progression mm -hmm. at the daily deaths and, and cases instead of the cumulative, it's already starting to decelerate. And this virus, by early to mid-April, it's going to be obvious to the world that this thing is going away. Mm -hmm. Now, it's held up more stubbornly than normal, but – but that was what causes the markets, uh, caused the markets most to bounce. Because you got to remember, my my key date, I think it was March 16th. That was a Monday after three days of the Federal Reserve announcing the most aggressive stimulus program, five trillion dollar yeah. repo line, <laughs> not just a couple hundred right, billion, yeah. and seven hundred and fifty billion of, of extra money printing and bond buying and, and buying junk bonds and everything and a bunch of other stuff and some fiscal stimulus. Yep. Monday, the market opens up, it drops 15%. The Dow dropped, you know, 15% wow. in one day. The market said, hey, been there, done that, okay? You mm -hmm. guys have been printing money for 11 years and we're in this big a crisis. So it was seeing the virus turn around and could see that, hey, this thing is going away for now. So we're in a bounce. And so I tell people, the focus is to understand this virus is a trigger, a big trigger. And we are in a, in a shock that's going to cause deflation. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering right now, I'm telling the gold bugs and people following gold, why is gold going up? Oh, yeah, infinite money printing. But what about a deflation shock? What if prices go down 5 or 10% on the next CPI report a month from now? You think gold's mm -hmm. going to go up with that? Gold hates deflation and mm -hmm. loves inflation. So I think everybody's going to – everybody knows this is bad, yeah. but it's going to be more shocking when you actually see the statistics and see the impacts. And I'll give you a quick example, Jason, because I went through – in Puerto Rico, well, I moved here four years ago for all types of reasons and really happy I did. Right. But we got to hit the, you know, the worst hurricane in 90 to 100 years. Mm -hmm. We had a three-month shock. 
Mm-hmm. I mean, electricity was just mostly oh, yeah. out. Yeah. No cable or TV. I couldn't even watch CNBC for right. crying out yeah. loud. No internet most of the time. Cell phone only worked on my 17th floor. As soon as I hit the ground, that didn't even work. Mm-hmm. So my wife and I had to escape to New York for three months. Mm-hmm. So we had a, a, a thing like this, a dead economy for three months. And guess what? Did we have a V-shaped recovery? No. Mm-hmm. It was U-shaped. And so that's what this is like. What I noticed real simply, particularly small businesses, I had 21 restaurants within walking distance. I mean, literally a block and a half walking How distance. How many reopened? Yeah. 25% of them never reopened. Oh. So those jobs with them, of course, tons of other businesses like that as well. So people don't get that either. There is no going back to normal here near term or even in the next few years for major industries like travel and major entertainment. I mean, I I was supposed to be in Australia right now Mm -hmm. on, on a five city tour for two weeks. No. Next week, I'm doing a full day online live stream. Mm-hmm. We've never done that right. before. We're probably going to have 4,000 people on that, that's more than good, we would have gotten at the live seminar. That's a great point. Okay, so let me stop you there. I agree with you. I think we are going to come out of this into a much smaller economy globally, not just the U.S., but every economy yeah. is just going to be smaller. I think people are more interested in a simpler life. And I think we're going to kind of go back to basics a bit. When I think of the Depression, I think of that show I used to watch the reruns of when I was a kid, The Waltons. Of course, you remember The Waltons, right? That's my picture of the Great Depression back in the 30s. And I just think we're going back to basics. And a lot of these industries just will never recover. You can't can't run a restaurant at 25 to 50% capacity with social distancing. You can't run an airline. It it, it takes most of the fun out of it. And and, 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 not to mention the economics. Cruise ships will slowly, <laughs> yeah. cruise ships will take years because cruise ships are in a very good demographic, yeah. older boomers who are sick of the stress of real travel mm-hmm. and all that sort of stuff. So, but the thing is, though, still longer term, I mean, a few years from now, first of all, we have a big crash to go through. So that's a whole nother topic. But people earn and spend about the same amount of money. They'll just shift it to other things, quality of life. And and I tell you, I I think a lot of people realize My gosh, why do I go to work every day? Maybe two weeks a day, uh, a week, uh, two times a week is worth it for my business. And then I can have more time at home, don't have to dress up much, more time with my kids. But we can spend more money on other things. And I've had this thing in tour. I've tried to convince my promoters in Australia for years. They say, Harry, you got to go there live. It just doesn't work. We're getting more people on this webinar than we ever got live at a fraction of the cost. So people do business better. We're going to get better because of this. I always call it like the Great Depression, any recession, the pause that refreshes. Anytime things go wrong, it forces us to think different or or reevaluate stuff. And guess what? We get smarter. We don't get dumber. We get smarter. Right. We get more efficient. So every time there's a war, and this is essentially a type of a war we're living in now, we create new technologies, new efficiencies, or at least we accept them. And now people have accepted online meetings, whereas before they just wouldn't adopt them. And so all of those efficiencies that are being created are going to stick with us. And that's a good thing. I mean, Harry, if you don't have to fly to Australia and waste all those travel days. You may want to go to Australia. Sure. Like a week each I, way. I know. Yeah. So it's a lot. You're going to be a lot more productive sharing your knowledge on that live webinar, and then you'll be able to do other things and create more value in the economy by not moving around. Moving around. Yeah. Yeah. Is the truth waste. is, like, here's an example of simple economics. I'll make half as much money doing this online right. in a tenth of the time, not even right. a tenth, uh, right. which frees up a it's lot a more time yeah. to do other things right. that I can charge. It's more. a and better again, deal the, for you and your audience. It and is. Your, and the promoter. It's a better deal yeah. for everybody. And, and, you know, people always, you know, the, it's my biggest criticism of central banks. Mm-hmm. I call them academic economists who've never had sex or run a business <laughs> dictating what happens in the economy. They think we should always grow. What's wrong with these people? Can you function without going to sleep six, seven hours a night? Try it for a few nights. You'll be turning in your mother to the Nazis. Right. Yeah, okay. Yeah, in a work. simple interrogation, yeah. you'll be so out of it. The body need. I mean, the economy needs to rest, innovate. We do innovate when things go bad rather than wars cause the greatest innovations, the deepest recessions, depressions. I, I study innovation. They always come at the most challenging times. 
and then they get adopted in the economy in the more benign times. It's a natural cycle. Grow and do maintenance, oh, repair, and, 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 and restore, yeah. Yeah. and transform, and, and boom and bust, and, and inflation and disinflation. These are natural cycles. The, the economists want what everybody wants in life, a zip line to heaven. We just grow, 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 get better, 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 go to heaven and stay there forever. Okay, maybe in heaven doesn't happen that way on earth here. So I go as far to say, Jason, most economists and particularly central bankers have no clue of what actually drives economy. In fact, what do they focus on? Governments. Governments are 20 percent of GDP and they're the lagging edge of the train. They're not the locomotive in the main part. Consumers drive 70 percent of GDP directly with their spending. Business capital investment to gear up to meet their growth is the other 10 percent. That's 80. Governments, 20. And consumers and businesses are the leading edge. Governments are lagging edge. Why is everybody studying government policies? Right now, it's a big deal because they're – what are they doing? Reacting. Reacting to a problem. They're not yes. proactive. So why would you look at the government as any sort of leading indicator unless it's a dictator who can do whatever they want, whatever they want? Right. Well, because people just have this odd, unusual faith in government that government's going to rescue me, this cradle to grave mentality. It's totally unproductive. It's ridiculous. It doesn't work. You but, know? you know, whether it's good government or not, they still don't drive the economy. Right. And so I look at people. That's why, you know, you said demographics was mm -hmm. my specialty, yeah. although I do a lot of other cycles. Technology is the other big demographics. When generations grow up, become more, they don't just spend more money, they become more productive at workers at the same time. It's a win win. Supply and demand expand in a boom. I can tell those booms in any country roughly decades ahead. It's a predictable thing. Numbers of people born, add in immigrants, I can adjust for that. When will they spend the most money in the highest number? Piece of cake. Mm -hmm. I can tell people when every country in the world is going to peak in their overall spending. And you know what? China is done. Yeah. Right. India is just getting going. Yeah. People yeah. think yeah. India will never be the next China. China will have, won't be able to keep up with India. Ch China is not going to be the next China. Um, no. and, and you know what? I want to ask you about that because we've talked about that before. I think this is your 11th time on my show. And it's always great to have you. China's one child policy has really set in motion a future demographic disaster. What yeah. years does that hit? I want to say it's in about 10 to 15 years that they no, really no. start suffering. Already hit. Oh, already. 2011 was their peak workforce ever. Okay. It's been declining ever since. It'll continue to decline for decades uh -huh. and decades. China doesn't have immigration. People mm -hmm. don't move to China. Right. Chinese move out of, out China, of China, particularly sure. rich people, mm -hmm. to get their money yeah. out of China right. because it's not a trustworthy yeah. government. Right. It's not a democracy. Right. Now, the other thing, though, China's done something worse than that. That was way in the past. OK, okay. they've tried to lighten up on that. Guess what? It hasn't done any good. Once people get urban, mm -hmm. they don't want to have kids mm -hmm. everywhere in the world. China's done something worse. They've created the biggest top down over expansion. They've driven urbanization a lot faster than normal progressions that it's easier to tolerate. They've got excess capacity in industry across the board, 20%, 22% empty homes and cities, condos, mm -hmm. 22%. Yeah. And at the same time, engineered by the government, they've got the highest priced real estate compared to income in the whole world. Yeah. And, um, and guess what else? People are that's afraid a, that's to live. A, that's a bigger disaster than their demographic slowing. And the people, biggest debt bubble in history about to crash. Right. And people are afraid to live in high density areas now. So, yeah. uh, you know, if you got to be in an elevator or mass transit, those are the two biggest danger zones, according to me. <laughs> um, and yeah. uh, and social distancing is the new normal. It's going to be interesting for sure. Um, Harry, you mentioned gold earlier, and I just I don't know if I've ever talked to you much about I, I'm just kind of curious your take. I have a feeling I know what it is, but I won't say it. I'll let you say it. What do you think about, you know, cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin? What does Harry Dent think about that? I don't know if we've ever talked about it. Well, slightly different things. They're supposed to be the same. And, and crypto could eventually be the digital gold as a standard for money. But they're nowhere near that. Number one, I'm going to start with Bitcoin and yeah. cryptocurrency. They're in what I call the hype phase, the same place the internet retailers like Amazon and the new dot com those all those surged at the end, at the very end of the last tech bubble mm -hmm. between late 98 and early 2000, gave it most of its oomph, 
companies valued AOL, which actually had real sales and earnings. Right. Most of them had none. Right. It's valued at 400 times earnings. Oh I mean, that, that was an impossibility. Yeah. And a well, lot look of at, look at Zoom no now. Sales. Zoom is about yeah. there. Yeah. Billion dollar companies with no sales or very little sales and losses. So that's the hype phase. Hyped up and then they busted. 95%. Tech stocks went down 78 in that big crash. They went down 95. Mm -hmm. Crypto is the same thing. They've had a great bubble, bigger than the internet bubble, not in capitalization, but in, in size of the bubble, but, but up there. And I think they're going to crash. You don't know that the crypto has gone through this uh, hype phase, Bitcoin and all these companies, until you see a lot of companies, a lot of companies fail, like the internets did in the early 2000s. Mm -hmm. yeah. That hasn't happened yet. So I keep lecturing to crypto conference. They say, oh, Harry, if you're right about this big crash, just going to usher in the digital currency age. People are going to not trust currency. I'd say, uh, after that, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> after that, you guys are the biggest bubble and you're going to burst the most. Now, what did we just see in this crash? What What went down more than stocks? Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. yep. Stocks went down 40 percent at worst. Uh, Bitcoin went down like 50 some percent. Gold did what it did in 2008, went up. Now, just I'm talking just the early stage of this crash. The first several days went up a little bit. Oh, money printing, you know. And then when the crash hits, it goes down 12 percent. Gold ended up down. It was not the hedge to the stock. What went up? Treasury bonds. High. What I've been saying, yeah. highest quality long term bonds like the falling interest rates, the deflationary side, and don't have default risk like a lot of corporate bonds do. So crypto did the worst. And I've been telling the crypto people, you're going to have the biggest crash when I'm right. And then you'll be the next big thing because Internet had the biggest crash. Mm -hmm. Amazon went from six to 166, back down to six and now to 2400, mm -hmm. 15 years later. Yeah. Greatest boom in history. I mean, one of the, you know, yeah. they were, internet was the next big thing, but it had to go through its shakeout first because it was sure. it was mostly baloney. Yeah, yeah. The, you know, pets, so, the pets.com sock puppet and all the yeah, web So gold, gold is not yeah. the safe haven. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, sorry. It's not the worst place to be. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in the first crash, it only went down half as much as other commodities. It was down 45% when other things were down 70, 80, 85 for oil. Mm -hmm. Next time it's going to be down a little more on my targets, 950 to 1000. That'll be a lot better than silver and other metals and other commodities. They'll be down 80% plus, but it's not going to be your hedge. Mm -hmm. Why? Gold correlates with one thing and better than any other probably investment in the world. It's easy to buy inflation. Yeah, sure. Gold likes inflation. The gold bugs are stuck on the last crisis from 68 to 82 when we had inflationary recessions. Mm -hmm. Inflation up, right. economy down. Yeah, stagflation. That's right in, my, right. Yeah, yeah. right in my summer season for the economy that was predictable to happen. Mm -hmm. So here we have a deflationary. Why are they printing all this money? They have to constantly print money to keep the economy from falling in deflation. Deflation happens when asset bubbles burst like stocks in real estate where people have a lot of money tied up and money disappears. Mm -hmm. And when debt fails and is restructured, which is another way, money disappears. Mm -hmm. When money disappears, less money chasing the same goods and financial assets, right. everything goes down. Sure. Financial assets the most, but consumer prices go down as well. Right. So gold is going, I think, very is, is keeps edging up while bond yields are going down. Bond yields are going down after this recovery from the crash saying, oh, I see weakness from this virus thing, and it is going to be very U-shaped. Stocks are now finally getting some reality. Oh, yeah, what were we thinking? Mm -hmm. We're going to go right back to normal. I mean, right. stocks on the NASDAQ got near its highs, you know, mm -hmm. what, 8 or 9% from its highs. That's absurd yeah. with what's just happened. So stocks are going down. Gold's still edging up thinking, yeah, but they're going to print, 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 print. But they get, gold's got to remember, 2013, 12 to 13 transition. Print, print, print. Japan was the first to go to what I call unlimited, just you know, printing off the charts. And inflation kept going down. The gold bugs finally had to admit, oh my gosh, money printing doesn't necessarily cause inflation. Oh my God, Milton Friedman was wrong when he says it's entirely a monetary right. phenomenon, yeah. which I've been saying for years. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's what's gonna happen here. I think gold is gonna follow bonds. If I wanna look short term at the economy, do I look at stocks, gold, or bonds? I look at bonds. Bonds okay. are the most sensitive to short term risk. The bond market is saying, I see things going down. And in fact, 
the I just got a chart from a friend in Australia, the 30 year treasury bond, the speculators, not the commercial, not the smart money, the speculators, the broad investors are the most bearish on 30 year treasury bonds, which says they think inflation and interest rates are going up. That tells me it's going the other way. Harry, I want to ask you. It goes you, the other way. Yeah. Gold is going to do poorly. If money printing does not cause inflation and Friedman's statement about it's always a monetary phenomenon, we all know that very well, then what does cause inflation? Okay. First of all, the primary cause of everything I look at is people, mm -hmm. not government right. policies, short-term and reactive. Right. Birth rates, you know what caused amount the of greatest children, inflation and, in yeah, history? Right, yeah. Baby boomers right. entering the workforce. You know how much it costs to raise a kid? Mm -hmm. And how much? Two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. <laughs> yeah, two hundred fifty thousand. Yeah. Governments have to fund education. That's part of their budget, as well as other things. And the last people to invest in these people are businesses who hire them when they don't know their ass from a hole in the wall. Okay, mm -hmm. and they're eighteen or twenty or twenty-two. They need an office. They need equipment, and they need training. I have an indicator called workforce growth on a two and a half year lag that is the best correlation with short term and long term inflation people entering the workforce at great expense. Two and a half year lag because it takes about two and a half years get up. before they start to produce more right. than they're costing to those last businesses that invest in them. So that's the prime cause. But for short term inflation or money creation, there's two ways to create money. And this is important. Mm -hmm. I, I had two great economists and they disagreed on this. The two, my two favorite one, David Stockman and Dr. Lacey Hunt. They're both brilliant, but they disagreed on one thing. Lacey Hunt was saying, hey, the only way to create money, Milton Friedman style, is banks multiply bank deposits. Right. We mm -hmm. deposit money, businesses, in. banks can lend 10 to 1 against that, only yep. pledge 10% of our deposits, lending. by the way, mm -hmm. not their deposits. And that multiplies money. So in a normal economy, that's how it happens. Economy's good. Businesses and consumers want to borrow money to buy things, houses or business capacity. Then multi money multiplies the with the multiply yeah. factor. And then if those loans keep being paid back, it continues to happen. That sort of expansion can cause consumer price inflation. Now, what has happened since 2008 and nine, we had failed demand. We had a, a excess capacity, a downward economy. Nobody wanted to borrow. Putting interest rates at zero did almost nothing. So what they did was they printed money and put that money into buying financial assets. Now, they, they tend to buy treasury bonds and asset-backed mortgages, which are treasury-related, but that doesn't matter. New money printed out of thin air is coming not into the banking system or to consumers or businesses, as it is recently, into financial assets, more money chasing what? The same assets, which includes stocks and, and everything and gold and even real estate and, and real estate investment trusts and all types of bonds. So what we've had, the gold bugs were saying, all oh, this money printing is going to create inflation. No, it created financial asset inflation. Right. So asset Stock. inflation versus yeah. consumer price inflation. Asset versus yeah. consumer inflation. Yeah. That's the bubble. Right. That's the bubble. And it's huge. It, it, you can compare this yeah. to the 1929 bubble, which was primarily stocks. People didn't yeah. speculate in real estate because right. you couldn't borrow. So mm -hmm. this is a whole nother thing. What's going to kill the Fed. I had Ray Dalio, mm -hmm. the most successful hedge fund manager right. in all of history, yep. stand up and say something stupid, mm -hmm. you know. He's been saying a lot of things lately I don't agree with, but yeah, go ahead. Yeah, he's saying, I'm not worried about that. He's saying we're at the top. He said he's got a six to seven year debt cycle and a long term 75 to 100. Well, I've got one, too. It's called 90 years. I'm a much more accurate about this. Mm -hmm. 90 years right down to it. He said, but I'm not as worried about this crash coming off this bigger cycle because the debt ratios are not as bad. I said, Ray, this is not the problem. Mm -hmm. The biggest financial asset bubble, how much money just got trashed by one stock crash globally, about $20 trillion. That's 100% of US GDP. Right. That's 25% of global GDP yeah. disappeared right. in five weeks. Evaporated. Yeah. So these asset bubbles can deflate which means money disappears much faster. If you, for debts to deflate and deleverage, you got to go through chapter seven or chapter 11, and that takes some time and blah, 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 blah. And, and we're going to see a lot of that. This is way worse than the debt bubble, which was the primary cause of the 29 crash. This is a financial asset bubble that 
is absolute bonkers. Mm -hmm. and, and people are treating me every time I interview some mainstream economist or or a person, they're like, Harry, you're crazy. You just predict extreme stuff. I said, you think I created this extreme period? This is the greatest bubble in history and bubbles burst mm -hmm. faster than they build greater than anything else in history. I'm not creating this. I'm just reporting on it. I'm, they're acting like I'm the crazy guy. I'm the, one of the few sane people on earth right now. Warren Buffett doesn't see a problem with this crap. Mm -hmm. What does that tell you? Warren yeah. Buffett right. yeah. says everything's okay, except he's not buying stocks yeah. right yeah. now. I know he's uh, sitting in cash. Yeah, yeah. yeah. hugely. Very interesting. You know, Harry, we got to wrap it up soon, but you've written a lot in your books about real estate and migration trends and things like that. And I remember a long time ago in one of your books, I read about Ashland, Oregon, and you talked a lot yeah. about that and how that was going to be a hot spot. And I actually traveled there just because I was like, I got to see what Harry's talking about. You know, that's that's how much influence you have. And I think there's going to be a major migration trend out of these high density living environments. And I I'm calling it the rise of suburbia. I think suburbia is coming back in a big well, way. You know, I, I call it exurbia. It's yeah. like beyond exurbia. Uh -huh. I mean, Bend, Oregon and Ashland. Ashland is what you I mean, talked about. Yeah. They, I mean, they're not, they're far yeah. away from a right. major metro center, right, right, and, but right. you can still get there and fly yeah, easily, sure. you know, quickly. Mm -hmm. In this online world, which we've just been kicked into deeper, mm -hmm. I mean, look at me. I'm in Puerto Rico. Now, yeah. I'm in a city of two and a half million, so right. I'm not in, in the sticks. My island property is yeah. in the sticks, okay, right. 30 minutes flight from here. But I can do business from here. Right. You know, Every, I can, Everybody can. That's yeah, the thing. So why you would don't, you want to yeah. live in a place like exactly. Ashland, Oregon? I've got a, a good friend in Miami who is a real estate kind of developer and speculator. Mm -hmm. He moved there to take over his mother's house and he and his wife stayed. Yeah, right. Much better lifestyle, much affordable. You know, they stayed. They didn't go back to Miami after stayed going where? there. So stayed where? Huh? In Puerto Rico? Ashland. Oh, in Ashland. Was, no, oh, okay. Ashland, yeah. And I was, just, I was just using it's Ashland as an example. The Ashland's not the thing. It's just an example because you wrote about it years ago, you know, like 20 years ago. But this idea that people do not need to be in these big cities anymore. Right. They've always had this attraction. And now both employees and employers have realized they can make the work at home thing work. The remote work thing does work. I mean, listen, we've done it for eight years. We gave up our last office in Southern California eight years ago, and it has advantages and disadvantages. But most of our people, they love working at home. And now you can get a better workforce because it doesn't matter where they're located. It's geographically independent. So you really have a bigger pool of candidates to yeah. pick from. Uh, but and, see, there's, but there's, there's a bigger range. Yeah. For me, I'm in San Juan. My my vacation place is a 30 minute flight, right. 60 miles away. OK, yeah. I go there on vacation. I couldn't live there. I'd be bored to death. That is more remote than Ashland, Oregon, as mm -hmm. far as a small town right. and nothing to do. Yeah. So I have the city life. But like you say, even if I wanted to be in New York City, why would I need to go to work every day into an office and dress up and get on mass sure. transit, sure. And waste all the time? Why not I do that a couple times a week yeah. and then work the rest of the time from home? So I want to be in a big city the hybrid model. because I want yeah. all the restaurants and right. activity. I don't want, need to be in a big city to work. Right. But if some of that evaporates, the Broadway shows evaporate, the restaurants evaporate, and oh, the cost yeah. of living and the taxes are still... Back. Yeah, why are, be in New York City? Yeah, there's just really not a compelling reason to be there. So I think suburbia is coming back. So the question is, if you're a real estate investor, which will be the stronger trend? The smaller economy that we're coming into and the economic hardship we're coming into, or and we've already began that, or the migration of people with a lot of money to spend out of these expensive, densely populated areas into suburban properties. And, you know, that's that's what our people have been investing in. I think it's going to be a pretty good strategy. And America is going to be on the move. The world's going to be on the move. But yeah, the yeah, rest you know, of the world doesn't always, have... I mean, the bubble alone dictates the greater the bubble, the greater the burst. Where's the most bubbly cities? Right. Manhattan, yeah, sure. San Francisco. Yeah. San yeah. Diego, Vancouver, yeah, Miami, San Diego, Vancouver, yeah. Toronto, yeah. LA, yeah, Sydney and Melbourne yeah. and Australia, the mm -hmm. densest yeah. cities. So they go down the most. And yet, right. uh, particularly uh, wealthier people are going to tend, at least some of them are going to migrate out. And that's just going to feed that downturn more. Mm -hmm. Another sector that's going to get killed always does commercial real estate. Oh, yeah. 
People oh, are emotional so about bad. their real estate yeah. and don't sell their house. Or right. Businesses will abandon a lease or, or sell an office building <laughs> overnight if it makes yeah. economic sense. So sure. commercial always gets hit harder. So high-end real estate, commercial gets hit the hardest. McMansions mm -hmm. get hit harder mm -hmm. than everyday suburban home. The everyday suburban affordable home mm -hmm. is both attractive now to the new millennials coming up, the new wave, who still haven't bought a lot of their houses yet because right. they haven't been able to afford to, yep. and retiring baby boomers who mm -hmm. don't have the kids and want to downsize. They just need a two, three bedroom house. And yeah, yo, they even less need to be in the city. Right. They can be in a nice, quiet suburb. Mm -hmm. So those are the best houses to buy in the downturn, mm -hmm. the best houses to keep. And I, I, I've been working with a guy in Arizona that's training people to take over over I mean, McMansions when they collapse and turn them into assisted living mm -hmm. things because yeah. large houses yeah. will be useful right. for small assisted living facilities. Mm -hmm. In suburbs where people would rather I, That's probably my friend Gene. I, I know him. Yeah, Gene. Yeah, yeah. So the thing about that is I kind of wonder because, you know, the, the assisted living homes have been such hot spots for, you know, high death rates and infection rates. And I agree that the size of that, the smaller home you're in, the better chances you have of survival. But I even think, I think there's going to be a trend really toward multi-generational living, which is, you know, very common around. Yeah around the world. Oh, people may keep a McMansion so they can have, they, they their, have uh, their parents, parents there. in there. And it, but it doesn't even have to be a McMansion. It can just be, you know, a suburban four-bedroom house or, you know, a house with a casita in the back, not even a McMansion, just a, you know, well, a nice well, One of the things house. I see, if you think the way I think, yeah. because the high end is so much more overvalued, that why would you buy an everyday suburban home when you can buy a McMansion with two or three extra bedrooms right. and a bigger lot, for not, for much not more. a lot yeah. more, I know. and yeah. you could house your parents there yeah. instead of having them in an assisted living facility, right. yeah, yeah, which no. costs, by the way, nine to ten grand from our experience yeah. a month. Yeah, yeah, it's it's very expensive, and I think the insurance is going to be tough to get on those because the infection rate problem and and just in general the insurance industry having so many problems. I mean, there's a massive wave of claims coming at the insurance industry, and yeah. we're going to see a lot of problems with insurance real soon too. So, so yeah, I think multi generational living, roommates splitting up getting their own houses they they need that extra Two families yeah. may live in one big mansion at 20 percent more the price but you yeah. split that you're both saving money so yeah i again but that's the me, opposite of the two single people as roommates in a two-bedroom place yeah because now yeah. they need Back that second bedroom for a home office okay and uh, uh Okay, but all ahead. of these are good changes. If we use our real estate better, mm -hmm. if we save money on certain things or commuting. Mm -hmm. I mean, look at pollution levels have just disappeared. Oh, totally a lot declined. Of yeah. And traffic congestion. Yeah. These are the two biggest problems. I know, in cities. It's kind of so, nice in a lot of ways. Yeah. This is a big win win. See, this is why I love change. People hate change. Yeah. I love change. Yeah. Change makes things better. It can mm -hmm. happen too rapidly sometimes. Yeah. But this is going to be a good thing. I'm just warning people, as you know, Jason, this is going to be a major shock, more than anybody's ever going to see in their past lifetime because you weren't around in the early 30s right. or going to see in the future. Financial assets, stocks are going to end up falling 80 percent or more. Real Ooh. estate in the U.S., 40 to 50 percent, more yeah. than last yeah. time. High end real estate, commercial Gold real estate. Gold is even going to yeah. fall. The one mm -hmm. true money. Yes, mm -hmm. that's going to fall and people are going to be in shock. This does not have to happen. These are predictable things. We've got this first crash, 40%, exactly what I predicted it would be. We're, getting, we're in this four, five, six month rebound, which is typical, where it's choppy and won't go a lot higher, but stocks will hold up in hope. And then we'll fail again and we'll go into real deleveraging. Well, and they're being propped up the by the Fed. Downturn. You know, the, the stock yeah, market's if just If people being... don't, if people don't prepare for the next, it's all right if you got whacked 40% because it's already, you've already gotten half of it back, you right. know, to make yeah. it a little better. Mm -hmm. What's going to be the crime is if you don't see this and get ahead of the next one, because the next one's going to be much deeper and longer. And it's going to be a once in a lifetime threat to your financial assets and business, but it's also gonna be a once in a lifetime sale on financial assets and businesses and business assets on the bottom. If you do get out like Joseph Kennedy, or you do hunker down like General Motors in the early 30s and pass your competitors. General Motors passed Ford forever to become number one in cars for the first time and then became number one in global corporations. That 
largely was made by its handling of the 3032 crash. Yeah, the world's first billionaire came out of the Great Depression, J. Paul Getty. Uh, well, so there's a, a saying, Joseph Kennedy. He yeah. was a multimillionaire bootlegger, right. yeah. came out ultimately a billionaire political dynasty. Mm -hmm. Same thing yeah. out of that crash. He yeah. got out of the top, reinvested when businesses were selling for 80 to 90 percent right. off. That's yeah. a sale. That's what J. Paul Getty was doing. He was buying up yeah. oil companies. So, yeah. Yeah. The mafia made more money than anybody in the Great Depression. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They, they, they were loan sharks at 20 percent with high cash flow from the bootlegging roaring yeah. 20s. Right. And then uh, the businesses that didn't pay them 20 percent failed. They just took over mm -hmm. at the bottom and owned it half of New York and Chicago. Right, coming right. Out. Well, you know, the saying recessions create millionaires and depressions yeah. create billionaires. So we will see how it goes. But I agree with you. There's a lot of opportunity, a lot of good things that come out of this. Harry, give out your website website? HarryDent.com. So we have a free daily newsletter you can get on to get to know us if you don't already know us. And, and of course, and we've just split off from our marketing company we used to work with. So we're pushing our whole new letter with a monthly from me and from Rodney Johnson, my partner, yep. both under the same roof for a very not attractive price. So you can get on our full newsletters, but you can be on our free newsletter as long as you want to, to get a feeling for whether we make sense or not. And I think you're going to find in the next several months, we're going to make a lot of sense because yeah. I'm telling you, nobody else is right now. Yeah. Good stuff. Harry Dent, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you so much for listening. Please be sure to subscribe so that you don't miss any episodes. Be sure to check out the show's specific website and our general website, HartmanMedia.com, for appropriate disclaimers and terms of service. Remember that guest opinions are their own. And if you require specific legal or tax advice or advice in any other specialized area, please consult an appropriate professional. And we also very much appreciate you reviewing the show. Please go to iTunes or Stitcher Radio or whatever platform you're using and write a review for the show. We would very much appreciate that. And be sure to make it official and subscribe so you do not miss any episodes. We look forward to seeing you on the next episode. Music.